Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Nicola Blackwood MP is Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Public Health and Innovation at the Department of Health. Um, her list of responsibilities at the department is uh, very long. Uh, it runs to, by my count, 17 areas and includes not only health protection and health improvement, uh, but also such topics as diabetes, children's health, and mental health services. It also includes uh, data and technology, research and development, life sciences, innovation, genomics, and uh, AMR. Uh, you can see that Jane is an exceptionally busy minister. Uh, you can see that concern for patients inevitably lies at the heart uh, of what she's uh, been able to do. Uh, and I'm extraordinarily grateful that she's been able to find the time in her busy schedule to talk to us this morning. Welcome, Minister. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, John. It is a real pleasure to be here um, this morning, and um, this is a really important conference, bringing together the research community uh, with their most important partner, patients um, and the public. And who could have asked for um, a more insightful and inspiring challenge than Jane's words to us just now? And if I could just say one word to her before I get on with my words, it is don't stop talking. Please keep telling us exactly what you've just told us. It is incredibly important for us to hear that. Um, but I do greatly value everything um, that all of you here are doing as charities, as industry, researchers, and involved patients, people, um, as Ed has said, to tackle the real-life impact of the great global disease challenges that we face today, dementia, obesity, diabetes, through effective and restless mobilization of patient and public involvement. Because without the public backing for science, I and my fellow ministers would be in the dark. We would find it more difficult to make the case for government for exactly what we're doing here. Without patient and carer insight, today's research would be less robust, it would be less practical, and consequently it would be less relevant to the needs of future generations. As Ed just said, involving patients and people is now the must thing to do. And without the courage and the willingness of so many selfless patients up and down this country to take part in clinical trials, much of the life-saving research which we're seeing today just wouldn't get off the ground at all. And as a patient myself with a rare disease, I know firsthand the frustration and sometimes the despair of years and sometimes a lifetime of searching for that diagnosis and treatment. I know what it feels like to tell your story again and again to specialist after specialist and to start to doubt yourself and to feel the doubts of others. And I know the overwhelming relief that can come when you at last get that diagnosis, even if there is no silver bullet treatment at the end of it, because at least you know that you weren't going mad along the way. And I do recognize those tentacles that Jane spoke so eloquently about just now um, that go into all parts of your life. And that is why in this job, it has been so important to me to announce the largest ever investment into health research with 816 million in biomedical research centers followed up with 112 million for clinical research facilities, not to mention the 2 billion for science and innovation that was announced in the autumn statement. So that truly experimental research, clinical trials can happen, but also so that we can become the world leaders, not just in life sciences in the UK, but also in the practical reality of an NHS with personalized medicine right at its core. That is why your agenda here today is really so close to my heart. The UK has developed a world leading partnership with the public, a world beating partnership with the public, and I am proud of the leading role that the NIHR has played in this. From its support for Involve, which promotes and advances public involvement and advance, uh, advances across all of the NHR, IHR's activities, to its OK to Ask national campaign to raise public awareness of research in hospitals and GP surgeries. 
The NIHR and charity partners have developed joint dementia research and UK clinical trials gateway websites. They've enabled patients and carers to find their way into research more easily and quickly. Um, I know that later today there's going to be an NIHR session. I hope that you will go there and meet with the people there. You will give them your ideas about how we can do that work better. But two weeks ago, there was striking new data in the national headlines. Dementia has now overtaken heart disease to become the leading cause of death in England and Wales. The story behind that headline distills the essence of why today's conference is so necessary. On the one hand, we can celebrate patient focus, how patient-focused research has led to substantial decreases in mortality in some disease areas. But on the other hand, we face the stark reality of other growing disease burdens that only patient-focused research and innovation will reverse. And it was after the Second World War that Richard Dole and Bradford Hill did their pioneering research on health effects of tobacco. They gathered data from lung cancer patients right here in London hospitals and looked at the smoking habits of doctors, of all people. It took time for their findings to gain acceptance, and it was not until February 1954, after review by an expert committee, that the Minister for Health then, Ian McLeod, made a statement to Parliament recognising smoking as a factor in lung cancer. And he did act on the evidence. At least, in one sense, he acted on the evidence. He put in place new policies. But on the day that he made the statement, he chain-smoked through his press conference. <laughs> Uh, it does take time to bring in cultural change sometimes, but nevertheless, the message of the dangers of smoking took root, and the research grew, including the evidence of the link with heart disease. So smoking cessation, linked with the use of drugs such as statins, has brought down heart disease mortality dramatically. Patient data, research, the uptake of new medicines, public health interventions, all have contributed to the decline of a killer disease. But the other side of that news story is the scourge of dementia. It now is the cause of 11.6% of deaths and rising. This is a vast pressure on our health and care services. It is hugely distressing for families and for patients themselves. So the implementation of the government's challenge on dementia 2020 continues, and we must press ahead with this because it can only happen through active part partnership between public bodies, through charities, through companies, through service providers, but above all, with the patients and carers affected right at the heart of this. In 2015-16, the government invested 100 million in dementia research, but we cannot rest here. One of the projects that we're working on is examining the effect of access of assistive technologies and telecare on the length of time vulnerable dementia patients can remain safely in their homes. Whether for dementia or other diseases and conditions, innovation holds the key here. Uh, and the whole process of innovation through the uptake and the dissemination needs of patients at its core, their thoughts and preferences, their ideas and their data must be put at the core of the innovation process because we want an, 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 an NHS that embraces innovation a system working in collaboration with innovators to get products to patients more quickly and to provide value evidence of product outcomes to those who are developing those products. That's why the government welcomed the final report of the Accelerated Access Review last month. It's why we're working on how we're going to respond to it as quickly as possible. And patients must be central to that review because it highlights the need for greater patient engagement to ensure that the experience of living with a condition helps shape the priorities for new treatments. The charity coalition National Voices developed I statements and published alongside the review to support the best practice in patient engagement by setting patient and citizen expectations in research and innovation. And the third sector has a key role to play in the AAR and its response for some impressive innovations. Myeloma UK, for example, is developing a digital health tracking tool which helps patients manage their own care and focus on attributes to support them, such as pain and fatigue. 
and we're, deliver we're already delivering for patients, but there is more that we need to do. For the AAR, we need time to work through the details to get it right, but I am determined that we will deliver a response that will get innovation through the NHS for the benefit of patients, and the measures outlined in the AAR will make the UK a more attractive environment for life sciences and medtech innovators to design, develop, and, de and deploy innovative health technology with products to benefit patients. But the technologies need to be used as part of holistic treatment pathways so that we can get the best patient outcomes for them. That is exactly what the NHS Innovation Accelerator aims to deliver. For those of you who don't know what this is, the NHS Innovation Accelerator is supposed to realise the commitment in the five-year forward view to create conditions and the cultural change necessary for proven innovations to be adopted faster and more systematically throughout the NHS so that patients can actually get them in their lives. This is being delivered in partnership with the 15 academic health sciences networks across the country. AHSN initiatives are patient facing so that patients actually experience this. Monster Manor, for example, is a free app launched by the Oxford AHSN Diabetes Clinical Network. It encourages children with type 1 diabetes to track their blood glucose reading and become more engaged with their diabetes management. By logging readings, players earn rewards that help them to advance through the game and become more stable with their glucose management. The Yorkshire and Humber AHSN is implementing a locally developed set of tools to support general practice and community pharmacy in fostering greater self-care and health literacy along, among patients with diabetes to encourage them to prevent severe hypoglycemic episodes. A particular benefit of the AHSN network is the best practice sharing system, which is now in place. So this means that when you have an improvement in Oxford to help type one diabetes, it can spread across the country. When you have an improvement in Yorkshire and Humberside, it can also spread across the country. This is one of the ways we're trying to make sure that the innovation benefits which we are starting to see can be driven right through the country. Another way in which we're trying to accelerate innovation is the Internet of Things Innovation Diabetes Testbed. This is funded by the department. It enables people with type one or type two diabetes to do the right thing at the right time in self-managing their condition. I know from my own experience, as Jane has mentioned, it can be hard to self-manage a long-term condition. So help with this is particularly valuable. People get a real-time view with this project of their own data so they can take prompt action to prevent their own condition from getting worse. And it encourages more timely and appropriate interventions from healthcare professionals. And it is hoped that by using this technology, it will also create much more genuine and immediate partnerships between patients and their healthcare professionals. And that is what this conference is all about. It is about a patient-centric agenda which is interested in more than mere words and tokenism. But instead, it is one that is truly driving innovation all the way through the NHS for the benefit of patients and their everyday outcomes. Increases in the prevalence of dementia, obesity and diabetes are the real challenges that we are facing every day in the NHS and that patients like myself know only too well. These are unmet needs across the disease spectrum, and we know that only a determined and persistent deepening in our partnership with patients will bring further progress. Today, as a health minister, I commit to doing everything that I can to reduce the disease burdens by putting patients first. And I hope that each and every one of you here today will join me in that commitment, because making patients central to our quest for better treatments and approaches to prevention, by involving patients to build the evidence, by using that evidence, and by acting on that evidence, patients and the people of this nation beyond will experience the benefit of those innovations. Families, the NHS, and the economy, all of those will benefit, and we will keep Britain where it should be, at the forefront of global science and innovation, and we will know that we have done everything that we could to tackle the global health challenges that we face today. Thank you very much.